gamma rays that were coming out of the reactor. Whoever thought of uh, masonite, I have no idea, but it's amazing that, that uh, they had to find all these things to make it work. And what they're doing is milling blocks of masonite down to thousandths of an inch, much, much finer than anybody would ever bother in any other kind of construction. It does not look like nuclear reactors in our day and age. This was the temporary construction building where they fabricated uh, many of the uh, parts of the reactors. Uh, what we're going to see next is actually milling the graphite that they filled the interior of the reactor with. Uh, they didn't use water as a moderator, they used graphite to slow down the neutrons and allow the uh, chain reaction to take place. And what you're looking at is a guy moving a four foot by four inch by four inch piece of graphite, milling it down precisely, less than the thickness of a piece of paper in accuracy, thousandths of an inch. Because they had to fill up a 36 by 36 by 28 foot cube with these graphite blocks, and they had to fit precisely. And they also had to have 2,000 holes drilled through them. And they also had to have 29 channels coming down and nine other channels coming across. It was an amazing maze of graphite had to fit absolutely perfectly or the chain reaction might not have been self-sustainable. When Hanford first got going, they were using woodworking machines to do all this. And as time went on, they got more sophisticated and dedicated machinery. And the dip they're taking out of that tube was probably to allow one of the vertical safety rods, they had a shaft that came down through the interior of the pile, and every block had to be milled around it to allow it to go through. The graphite had to be of the highest quality. The best graphite was used in the center of the pile where it would have, where the, the chain reaction was of the most critical amount. So the poorer graphite was used on the perimeter, but even that graphite was much, much of a higher quality than the graphite factories had ever had to build before. You can see them checking to make sure that the holes are absolutely uh, straight. Everything is stamped and numbered so they know where to put it in the pile. They cut slots in a lot of the uh, blocks to put keys in to help lock it all together, like that. Edges were chamfered to allow the helium gas to circulate through the pile and help cool and uh, keep the moisture out of the pile. That's one of the three reactors at Hanford. They built three originally. What we're looking at is the front face. 2004 fuel tubes came out from the front all the way through to the back. Every one of them had about 35 small pieces of uranium fuel in it, eight inch slugs of fuel, inch and a half in diameter. Something like over 70,000 pieces of fuel had to be handled on a regular basis, loading and unloading. Yeah, one of the things the Bee Reactor Museum Association is trying to do is preserve the first and only reactor that's going to be standing after Hanford is cleaned up, the Bee Reactor. This is what it looks like inside. Reminds me of a locomotive. This is the top of the reactor where the safety rods were stationed, 29 of them. They were used when the reactor had to be shut down very quickly. And you'll see them being raised and dropped in a uh, test. Beautiful amount. You know, the machinery was just amazing. Built very quickly, had no designs to work on prior to this. Built in a little more than a year's time. Now, the controls that ran all this, I don't know much about, but we do have somebody in our group who knows a lot. Let me quickly introduce him. But he worked with instruments way back when. This is a, uh, a control panel in the reactor, the process plant control panel. They uh, were the indicators for the rod positions, that's the control rods. And the sides where it shows the uh, controls for the rods. And then um, in front is the um, 
So, well, this, here is the uh, instruments for the shutting down the reactor in case of loss of water. There are 2003 uh, pressure switches. That's the piping going to the back of them. And the uh, thing. So, how, tell us why you know all this. Well, <laughs> actually, I was uh, there during the uh, uh, installation of the uh, instruments and also uh, during the startup. Thank you. That was Dee McCullough, by the way. He was there soon after all this was happening. Uh, what we're looking at right now <coughs> excuse me, is a heavily shielded uh, cab that uh, would go on the rear face crane uh, uh, behind the reactor where the radioactive slugs would come out when they emptied them out of the reactor and they needed a shielded cab like that if they needed to go out and watch and direct. Uh, the next few minutes is uh, showing all the various water related facilities which actually took up most of the 100 area. The reactor was just a small part of it. What we're seeing here is the retention basin which is actually should be shown last. That's where the water exiting the reactor went to this basin the wooden channel slowed it down as it flowed out, and it spent minutes or up to an hour there, I believe, and then would be emptied out into the river. This was what called a uh, once-through reactor. The water came in the front and went out the back, back into the river. So a lot of the scenes they're showing is about uh, the water. <clears throat> Here they're showing the helium uh, tanks that they used to uh, create the atmosphere inside the pile. Let me introduce somebody else here who was uh, goes way back, but uh, maybe you could tell us a few things what we're seeing or uh, have seen. So tell us your name. I, I am Bill McHugh. Uh, I was uh, tra I trained in the uh, University of Chicago for six months, and then I came out to uh, the uh, uh, 300 area and. Uh, we tested uh, uh, uranium and uh, uh, graphite as for suitability to use in in the reactor. In the uh, and uh, we tested those in the 305 pile. And then in August uh, of 44, I moved out to the 100 area because it was near enough completion that we could become familiar with the building and to test some of the equipment and get ready for, for operation which started in September of 1944. Tell us the name of the physicist with the slide rule that was there while you were in the control room. Oh. Enrico Fermi was an Italian physicist who had been in the uh, in Germany under Hitler and he was permitted to go to a scientific uh, seminar in Switzerland, and he forgot to come back. <laughs> <laughs> he went to the uh, to uh, the United States and uh, got an interview with the president. The Manhattan Project was formed, and uh, Hanford was built. Uh, they're still showing the water treatment plants. Uh, the amount of water that was needed to keep the reactor cool would have uh, fed the city of Seattle, or you know, a large city. Major, major water treatment for just one reactor. There were three of them. Uh, one of the primary reasons they built Hanford where they did was the Columbia River. Uh, second largest river in the country. Clear water compared to many rivers. Lots of it. It was cold. Um, so that was one of the important reasons for building it here as well as the desolation. They loved the 600 square miles they were able to get to build all this. Um, most of the pumps were backed up with steam-driven pumps. They had electric, elect electrically driven and steam-driven pumps. If there was an electrical outage, the steam pumps would kick in and continue on to keep the reactor cool. Um, a reactor without cold water was uh, going to be a molten mess very quickly, and they knew that the water was critical to keeping it healthy and happy. And there were many, many backup safety features in the controls and in the water system to ensure that the reactor would never be without water. 
And when you see the reactor now, when you drive out to the Vernita Bridge, you can look back and you see the B reactor sitting by itself in the middle of the desert with the C reactor about a half a mile away. You don't realize that it was a bustling industrial complex full of uh, buildings and piping and electrical wires and roads and railroads. Um, and the reactor was just a small part of it, kind of like the engine of a car without the rest of the car is the way I see it. How many people were here back in 43, uh, 44? Well, what are we, what are you, <laughs> we're telling you all this, you knew it already. Okay. Uh, I'm a newcomer. I came in 1995, so I hardly even count. But uh, they also built gigantic refrigeration plants for, I believe it was D or F reactor, only one of the reactors, because the colder the water was, the hotter they could run the reactor to create the plutonium. And if you had warm water, you could only raise the temperature a little bit. Ice cold water would let you run it even hotter. But the Columbia was sufficiently cold, and running a giant refrigeration plant was tri was especially uh, costly and difficult to operate, and they never needed them. They never used them. This was the main pump house that sent the water to the reactor. And it had not only electrical pumps and backup steam pumps working together, they actually built heavy flywheels into every pump, giant many tons tall flywheels. In the event that they lost all power, the water wouldn't cut off immediately. The flywheels would continue to pump long enough to keep the water moving that maybe they could get another system going, and they also wouldn't have a complete shutdown in the reactor itself. The beauty of it is, is that they were building from scratch. They had no idea how all this was going to work in the end, and it did. It actually did exactly as it was supposed to do and a lot of people take credit for it. It wasn't just a few people. It was the people operating it. It was the people designing it. It was the people uh, at Chicago. Uh, this is going through some of the people who uh, helped manage and run the site. And while this is going, I'm still curious, as Barb mentioned, it's kind of odd that you know, we see them making donuts and we also see them milling graphite blocks for the piles <laughs> when you know, they don't mix, and we, we never really figured out who they showed this to and when they showed it. And, you know, most likely it was well after the war was over when the secrecy wasn't so important. But I would still bet that all the scenes we were seeing of the reactor-related stuff does not, is not something that should have been distributed. You know, there were people in foreign countries that would have loved to have paid their dollar to see the movie. Take a few notes. So the only, there's going to be some remaining structures out at hand for the B reactor is, is the only one of the nine reactors that's going to be left standing. And the purpose of our organization has been working for nine years before I joined it uh, to push the DOE and the federal government and everybody who's interested into ensuring that the reactor remains open to the public someday as a museum. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go out there, it's an amazing site. And historically, it's even more amazing because there wasn't anything before it. It was the first one. Um, it has a very solid place in history. <coughs> Getting tired of fedoras yet? <laughs> or smoking? I did work up an appetite watching the cafeteria. Uh, one of the resources of the B Reactor Museum Association is uh, the people who are in it. And as you saw with Dee and Bill, we have people who can tell us firsthand what was going on back then. And it does complicate history a little because I will read something in a book that somehow they don't think sounds right and then I'm stuck trying to, it'd be much easier if we only had one or the other. But it's great having something so historically significant so recently built. It's not like it's 300 years old, it was just back recently. And it really brings the whole thing into a different perspective. Let me introduce one other person who's in our group. Larry, tell us who you are and what you were doing back then. Hello, I'm Larry Nenton. I come uh, to work at Hanford as a clerk. I'm a 
is issuing welding gases. They have no memory of how many thousands of acetylene and oxygen tanks were distributed, but it was very critical. As you could see the, the movie, all the piping and uh, tanks, basins that needed welding. <coughs> One of my roommates was a man that came out from New York City who was a professional welder, and he had a welding school at Hanford, or at uh, White Blood. And uh, it was very uh, necessary that all the welding was done right. You couldn't go back and redo most of it. Of course, all the steam lines around the plant could be gotten to, but most of your water lines were underground or behind walls that they couldn't get to. <clears throat> I later on uh, was in uh, shipping and we shipped out 3,000 carloads of excess material that they had brought in that they didn't use under construction. And the plant was uh, pretty much an overkill in every way they could go, as you saw it. They had more barracks, um, more equipment than was needed. Yards and yards of pipe that were used at valves that were returned to different depots around the nation. That's all I have, thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, what we're looking at now is the reason a lot of you are still here. Uh, those are the tanks that were used in 200 areas to store the waste from the uh, chemical separations process. That was the process that took the irradiated uranium fuel from the reactors and chemically separated out the small amounts of plutonium that was in it. Everything else was waste. They built these tanks to, to hold it until they could figure out what to do with it. They figured one of these tank farms was enough to keep the plant going for about a year. And that was long enough, they figured, to do what they were there to do, which was build enough plutonium to create a bomb. And as like Larry was saying, they x-rayed the welds. They could not come back in and fix these things. It had to be done precisely. The reactors were the same way. The piping in the, in the chemical separations building was the same. They didn't want any errors. They wanted it to work, and they, didn't, they weren't going to be able to come back and fix it. It had to be done very, very well. And in fact, the tanks, I think, have held up amazingly well, considering how many years it's been. Plutonium didn't even exist in the human mind a few years before this. It was discovered only a few years before. Uh, the credit is given to Glenn Seaborg at UC Berkeley. And once that was discovered, it happened almost concurrently with the idea that an atomic bomb could be built from uh, uranium. And the discovery of plutonium allowed a whole other way to go about creating an atomic bomb. And the reason Hanford was built was to create plutonium. The 221 buildings were the main long... Alera Volant to the checkout desk, please. The canyon buildings that you can still see from the highway, 800 feet long, 60 feet wide, 80 feet tall, long, long concrete buildings. Below ground were 40 what they called cells, rooms really, 20 feet, 13 by 17 feet, uh, 20 feet tall within which were the chemical separation equipment. Uh, you had dissolvers, centrifuges, storage tanks, precipitators, and they would dump a ton or two of uranium fuel at one end, dissolve it, and the process would move down the line under careful control, and at the other end, out would come a few pounds of plutonium, if they were not even that much from one batch of uranium. Very small amounts, and this is what it took to do it. It was no small job. It was not a little laboratory experiment. It's hard to say which of the separations plants or which of the reactors we were looking at. If you took your time, you might be able to tell by its placement with the river in the background or whatever. <clears throat> but they, were, they built three of them, all of which were going to be pretty much identical. The idea being, if one should not work, you had backups. Your capacity was a little greater. And uh, as it turns out, they only needed two of these, of the separations plants. 
uh, the system worked well enough, the chemical process worked well enough, that they were able to keep three reactors running just with two of the chemical separation plants. It's funny, when you talk to old timers, people who were here way back when, and listen to what their job was, you realize that many, many people say that the part they understood was critical to the process, whether it was fuel fabrication, getting water to the reactor, keeping the reactor under control, doing the chemical separations. There was dozens and dozens of critical bottlenecks that if that system didn't work, the whole place would not have worked. And you see it in every area of the What we're looking at now is the piping that they built <coughs> that led to one of the 40 cells. This was all, most of it was going to be covered in concrete. It had to be done perfectly. The library will close in 30 minutes. If you need to get a library card, pay for fines, or place an interlibrary loan request, please do so Bill that he took please somebody he so knew into the time. new reactor when Thank it was you. almost ready to go. And the front face was just a dazzle with stainless steel. Everywhere there was stainless steel. And his friend said, ah, oh, now I know where all the stainless steel went. We couldn't get any back in Delaware or wherever he was. <laughs> uh, it was in the middle of a war, and Hanford had top priority. This is the inside of one of the cells. 42 connectors, the little uh, fittings coming out are pipe and electrical connectors. They had to be placed precisely because every cell was built virtually identically so you could move equipment to any cell and hook it up without having to change anything. Just hook it up to the connectors you wanted. Sorry? by remote control. Everything was done by remote control, thank you. It, the process was highly radioactive. You couldn't have guys walking around down there. Uh, there was one crane operator in the canyon that could lift up the covers that covered up the, the heaviest concrete covers that you'll see in a minute and get down to the equipment remotely by crane. Uh, nobody could be in there while it was hot. Extremely tight tolerances, both in the pouring of the concrete, the setting of those pipe connectors, which is what they're working on there. Um, everything was down to the thousandths of an inch. Not literally a thousandth, but well, well tighter tolerances than you'd find in any similar construction in any other industry. Once this stuff was done, once they had run a batch of uranium through it, <clears throat> it was not easy to get anybody in there, if at all. It all had to be dealt with remotely by a crane, picking things up, unscrewing things with a, a remote impact wrench. Um, everything had to fit absolutely perfectly. If a piece of equipment broke, you could un unhook it, take it out, bring another one in, and hook it right up, and it would be ready to go. As Barb was saying, a lot of the work was done right here on site, both for efficiency and uh, where do you go to get this done in time to uh, get the job done. Time was of the essence. <clears throat> the movie doesn't really tell you, but there was a war going on while this was happening. And every minute that went by meant that the Germans were that much closer to creating an atomic bomb, we thought. Um, it was immensely, uh, it, was, it was the urgency of wartime pr production, whether it was radar or Boeing bombers or whatever it might be. But none of it looks like the atomic age to me. It all reminds me of, you know, Steamboat Willie and locomotives. But this was cutting edge. This was absolutely the height of our technology. Unless he went to MIT and talked to the guys who were developing radar, I guess. But nonetheless, it was uh, the birth of the atomic age. This is what it looked like. <coughs> the B reactor was the world's first production scale nuclear reactor. This was the world's first uh, chemical separations plants, which they still use. You know, many parts of the world reprocess their uh, reactor fuel. This is cute with the cellophane. <coughs> Cleanliness was critical as well as tolerances because any dirt or contamination would have really messed things up. But here's a guy wrapping things in cellophane. And what he's going to be wrapping is one of the pipe connectors that automatically clamped on to the connectors that came out of the cells. It's a fairly big thing. Is that before plastic? Uh, cellophane was before plastic, yeah. It's made cellulose. It's the stuff that burned in movie theaters and it, that they used to make film out of. Uh, that's one of the pipe connectors. There could be dozens of them in any one cell connecting various pipes to various pieces of equipment. And what we're looking at now is a <coughs> prefabricated pipe assembly that would pop into any one of the cells that it was designed for and fit exactly onto the connectors, 
and connect up the equipment that was in there to the pipe connectors that were on the wall and required nobody to be down there hammering, pounding, adjusting, tightening. It all just fit right in. This is how they transported them from the fabrication area back to the 221 buildings, the canyon buildings. It was no small task. Who, where they went to get those frames built, I don't know. It was, you know, they had to, the number of things they had to build was immense. It's mind-boggling. At least it boggles my mind, but that just might be because it's my own mind. The man back here is saying they built them on site. The, the frames they built on site. Well, there's something else that they said, ah, let's just build it. And as long as you had plenty of workers and plenty of materials and plenty of donuts, I guess you could do it. <laughs> but, you know, this was before computers, by the way. I know we can't remember those days very well. Before electric typewriters for most people. No hand calculators. Very few telephones. <clears throat> they had teletype to go back to Wilmington, Delaware, from DuPont. Uh, People took the train from Chicago to Wilmington, back out to Hanford. How do you get any work done when you're taking a train that doesn't have a cell phone? Yeah? Here's a guy that can tell you. What's that? Here's a fellow that can tell you about it. About trains? No. Which aspect? This is W.K. McCready. Oh, really? Mr. McCready. Maybe you could introduce yourself. already <laughs> Go ahead. Hold the microphone and say that. Uh, simply speaking, uh, I had an association with the separation plan. Uh, I've seen your name already. Uh, as I stayed on, uh, in the operation thing for a number of years. But for now, I don't think there's too much I can add. Uh, the only thing we can do is get it to fail. I can't speak to the issue of one thing about the business of uh, the frames and efficiency. This didn't involve Hanford, but when the work was going on heavily at Chicago, and DuPont was in it, and their headquarters, of course, was in Wilmington. They could go over to Philadelphia, get on the a bullet to the checkout desk? And the a bullet to the checkout yeah. desk? And at 6 o'clock in the morning, they'd be in Chicago, they could get off and go to work, which work all day. They could get a train now. <laughs> Thank you. It sounds pretty complicated to me, but that's the way you got across country back then. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you could probably get a lot of work done on a train compared to flying somewhere today where you don't have any time to do anything. Having a couple of days on a train. Inside like of a cell. Uh, what we're looking at is the inside of one of the cells. Uh, notice, I think that the, the title said 36 cells, or actually 40. Either they got it wrong or they weren't counting the first three that were just for a special purpose. But this is, you know, the cells might look like this or they might look like something else. It depended how they were designing or fine-tuning the chemical process. The whole building was made to be flexible. They didn't have the thing nailed down when they started. It had never been done before. They had no idea if it was going to work perfectly or not. They had to have flexibility. That was the key thing. Flexibility and remote maintenance uh, both meant that you had these 42 pipe connectors on the walls, equipment that would fit in perfectly. You saw earlier, while well, Mr. McCready was talking, uh, an impact wrench being lowered by the crane and undoing these connectors. The guy was up 60 feet up in the air, off to the side 50 feet, looking at a periscope straight down on top of the crane hook while he was undoing bolts and uh, yeah, Mr. McCready is nodding his head. It was no small task. It was amazing and this was not done over 10 years. It was done in like a year and a half, designed a year ahead of that. Uh, of course, there was 10 years of permitting before that. That's, that's the same <laughs> uh, these are the covers that went over the cells. Each There were four of those, that, one, two, three, four, on one cell. They weighed like 15 tons apiece. Big hook on the top, you see the eye of the hook, hook coming out. The crane would hook onto that and lift it up and pull it out of the way and then be able to go down in the cell to work on the equipment. They literally built runways of concrete 600 feet long to fabricate these. They needed like 300, they needed over 1,000, I think it said, 1,060 for all three separations plans. And they had to just set up an assembly line to make these special rail cars. Uh, it was amazing.
Great, thank you. You said everything I've said so far is true. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> But it is tough trying to be historically oriented when you're sitting next to people that work there. <laughs> uh, I forget what building this was, either the concentration building. There was two other buildings in the plutonium separations process after the big canyon. Once they got it through the canyon, the bulk had been reduced down to something like eight gallons or something like that, a very small amount, no longer highly radioactive, and they took it to another building to continue the chemical process. Less than two years. I think we're, we're winding down now. What they didn't tell you is that the thing worked. No. What they didn't tell you is that the thing worked. And that by uh, June 1945, they were shipping out, uh, before that actually, they were shipping out plutonium that ended up in Los Alamos. And in July, the first atomic bomb was detonated in the desert uh, with plutonium that was built right here at Hanford.